Hello and welcome to the Oxford Conservatives podcast, where we, today we shall be discussing masculinity. How are you doing, Joshua? I'm doing well, Archibald. How are you? Excellent. I'm doing splendidly, uh, just as a good chap should do. Indeed. Just as a man mm. should do, as we'll be discussing very soon. Indeed, yes. So, Joshua, to start off, as we always start off, as good philosophers do on definitions, what is masculinity? Masculinity is, quite simply, being a man. Now you could say, well, that's very obvious. Mm. But in the modern world, it is something which has been under attack a lot. People question what it means to be a man. Because in the past, a father knew what they needed to do. Our grandfather, when World War II came about, knew exactly what he needed to do to defend his country yeah. and be strong and provide for his family. Nowadays, yeah. people question it, people challenge it. But I would say what being a masculine man is ties back to those key principles of being strong, reliable, stable, being a provider, and also being able to face challenges and not crumble away in fear and distress. So wait here, Joshua. It sounds like you're putting a lot of sexist terminology out there of toxic masculinity. Is this not really damaging to young boys' mindset if they hear indeed what you're saying of a man must be strong, he must be stable, he must, you know, be reliable, and all these obviously terrible things that are heavily masculine and damaging? Isn't this really dangerous to say, uh, as some might put the charge to you? Hmm. I think you raised an interesting point there about toxic masculinity, and we'll get to that later, mm. because I do think there are boundaries where masculinity goes overboard, mm. where people like potentially Andrew Tate and other influencers may fall into that realm of toxic masculinity. But rather, what I think is important is to think about what else, mm. if not being strong, reliable, stable, being a provider, what else would a man be? Because we are not only thinking about the positives, but also the negative impacts of a certain proposition. If you say, let's not have it in this way, how else would we formulate it? And perhaps I'd like to pose that question to you. If we were to say, let's not have this idea of being strong, reliable, stable, and being a provider for one's family and the ones they care about, what would a man be? Well, I suppose the man would have to almost form in, into what in, in, traditionally would, would be the the, the, the theme, f f femininity, I suppose. Um, and here's, I suppose, we must make the, the clarital point. We're not here saying masculinity is better than femininity. Rather, if you've watched our prior, prior podcast on what is a woman, to some extent, um, there's this concept where it's yin and yang. They, they complement each other very nicely. So like on perhaps a croissant, you'd have jam and you'd have butter. Or a scone, rather, um, you'd have clotted cream and jam. They're both indispensable and both necessary. But they perform very different roles. And given the man's role doesn't bear children, doesn't birth children, hasn't have that innate nurture status as key uh, to be given by women, they have to naturally form a different role. And I'd say if they were not these attributes of strong, stable, provider, and so on, uh, they're rather left devoid of any of at least the social construct of a man. And the social construct is indeed very important. It's what builds up our society. Indeed, I, I strongly support that. Mm. And in fact, it, to, to further the argument that these mm. are not necessarily perhaps a sexist remark about yes. putting a, a burden on a man's shoulder which they cannot bear, I would say it's a necessary part based on mm. their psychological and biological traits. Mm. Although, of course, there will be times where people are going to vary. There are going to be anomalies in some circumstances. Yeah. Men, by and large, have higher levels of testosterone. They are mm. psychologically, if you look at big five personality traits, better at facing certain circumstances better, more so than females. And, and a lot of these arguments, which people can, has been proven rigorously in, in studies, have demonstrated that men are better at producing the, in the way of protection by fighting for a family and protecting a family. In the past, that might have been via physical threats. For example, if you're in the middle of the Maasai Mara, the coming of age yeah. for a young boy was to kill a lion. And that there's that very obvious, tangible fight with a physical danger. But even in today's society, I would say that men have a very tangible dangers within society that they have to face, both psychological, social, but also physical as well. For example, if you're in Ukraine, that might be something that you have to step into. Mm. Yes, yes, I, 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 I certainly see that. There's this, I think that there is a heavily psychological basis on the fact that man needs to have some form of purpose, provide, and, and, and do these things to, to fulfill his own desire and also to fulfil his, his natural role in society. So obviously, um, we form perhaps traditional views of society, and in traditional views of society, it is indeed a man, a woman, and the man does go out 
and provide and, and, and it's the steward as I suppose the Bible to some extent ordains at least in Genesis. Um, but we all have that and we, we, we understand the traditional form of man. What man would have to do would fight. Uh, for one's country would be the provider, would care, would hunt, um, and so on. But what is then the role in the society we are in today, where our society is intrinsically different? To, uh, you know, I'd say, argue to a worse extent, um, how it was uh, five, six hundred years ago, where the man's role was perhaps more prominent, where things are a lot more tranquil to some extent, or not as um, the usual ideas of when we imagine masculinity, and we all, I suppose, have this concept in our heads, regardless if we say that's an internal bias or not, we have that image that comes in of the man in sort of a, um, where it is, native environment, uh, very powerful uh, and being very masculine. But what is the role in, of a man today? What's the role in today's society? It's a very difficult question that you ask, because mm. there's so many circumstances which go into the role of a man as a provider. Mm. On some stances, you could say, well, the men still play an important role at the foundation of society. You think of electricians, you think of plumbers, you think of people who really are necessary to build houses, the brick and mortar work, perhaps, that you think of. Those people are, in the same way, acting in almost a physical sense. They have to carry bricks, do, do the dirty work, perhaps, that a lot of women are perhaps unwilling to do. Now, you could say there are some jobs that they could fill, but there also are certain circumstances where there is the equal challenge of the minimum standard of living or the minimum required income in order to sustain the family, especially when you have good Catholic families with loads of, with loads of children, the cost of living could be very, very high. Mm. And when it is the case that a man who would used to work a, a blue collar job and would still be able to support their family, now might not be able to do the same, there's a very big question of, well, should the woman then also go to work and also have to try to fight for um, some survival as well and fight for some income? And if that's the case, then, well, who looks after the children? If the, men, if the women also have to go to work, what actually is the balance there? What would you think about that? Well, I suppose we've always had those cases in the past where perhaps it's very unfortunate and the husband dies mm. and, and, and there are single mothers and they have to almost take on these two roles. We see it in nature to some extent where a woman... The females of nature do have to adapt, and men have to adapt to a certain extent when certain circumstances arise. So I'd put those in sort of a different category of cases. If we want to discuss something, it's easy to discuss in a generalised term. There's, at least in this modern world, a large, level, uh, heavy set of criticism levelled against generalisations, but sometimes they're rather useful. And if we have a traditional family model, as most families are, and at least in Ireland it's still accepted, uh, you know, Dea Gratias, the, the constitutional voting, it is, it is now still enshrined, this idea of a family and a traditional family and so on. Well, in that sense, I think the man should still provide, and that's a really downfall and a failing of capitalism to some extent, or at least the current nation state and the current status quo, where there's this failing being put. And just because there's a failing does not mean we should then accept this is how the role of a man should be, or this is how, what, how it has to be the role of a family, and both parents have to work and have to provide. But even let's say we take this economic argument out and say, oh, very well, we'll take this aspect out of the role of men, where both perhaps have to provide to some extent. Well, in that case, there's usually still one perhaps giving more childcare or the rest. But then they form a different role inside the family unit, where the mother perhaps will teach you know, the children uh, to be polite, to be courteous to some extent, to you know, clean themselves and so on, as mothers do, or perhaps uh, chide the, the children not into you know, swearing or all the rest. As, as mothers often do. But the father still has to be a strong figure and still has to you know, be a figurehead for the children, be strong, be disciplined. And it's really, in, in traditional sense at least, if your mother says no and so on, um, and she says, oh, very well, I sh when your father comes home, I shall tell him about this, it strikes uh, fear into the child. And he also should teach at least men how to be men, and the women should teach girls how to be uh, women and so on. So in this sense, you might learn manual skills from your father. You might uh, learn perhaps how to hunt or how to fish or um, how to be proper and courteous and not necessarily just pious, but also uh, have a great deal of uh, integrity, I think, about oneself and how to conduct oneself. And those are the roles split. And if we were to just sort of put it into one block, I think we, we lose a lot because one person cannot be 50 things at once, uh, as we discussed in the last episode, you can't. 
I suppose, not well, it's 200 years ago now, uh, you can't concurrently be a human, a fish, and a lion. They're not possible. Mm. Now, there's a lot you've touched on there, and perhaps I could push to you a bit on a few aspects. Mm. I think you yes. touched a bit upon capitalism and its relationship with the male, with the female in the family, and, and perhaps we could talk a bit more about that in relationship to the role of capitalism and the male. Yeah. Do you think that... I guess we want to have this traditional family model, which is valuable and, mm. and vital, and that's a good thing to work towards. But in the world today, we need a practical solution. How should someone act in, in the world today? Should Is there almost a stronger pressure that the man must find more way to make money, it, despite the system that's oppressing them? Or are there ways, other ways that we can exit this problem? Well, it's very difficult. I think we do then face this idea of toxic masculinity where it becomes damaging, the man feels that he's failing, but really, Having an ideal is something to strive for, it's something to work towards. And if we were to say, well, we reduce our ideals in order not to offend or make people's mental health better and so on, it's not very helpful because an ideal is rarely achieved to some greater or lesser extent. Or when it's achieved, it's, it's achieved, but there's always a greater, an ultimate ideal. Um, and there's always something better to strive for. And if we make the bar very low and we still don't achieve it, we're awfully low down, we, we've failed. But if we set the bar very, very high and we fall short, there's still a downside higher than if we set a low bar. Um, and at least that's something which is instilled in me. So, but in a practical solution, um, I suppose it is at least forming the strong traditional roles, it is as a role model for children, really, of what a man is, and being very much dis disciplined to some extent, having great integrity and being you know, strong in one's mindset, at least presenting that. And, and, that, and that, I think, is a duty. Some accuse that of being toxic masculinity and say, well, it's damaging men's mental health. And perhaps to some extent it, it does. But sometimes things are hard and, and they simply need to be done. Hmm. Now, we've talked a bit upon toxic masculinity and perhaps hmm. we should delve into it. But before we talk about what is toxic masculinity, and this ties very much into the next question, does toxic masculinity mm. exist? Yes. Perhaps let's start off with, does toxic masculinity exist? Because in some sense, toxic masculinity is one of those strange boundaries where you kind of have to discuss about what actually is the borderline course, to actually yes. get into what it actually is. You got what I mean? Well, I find it a bit... It's, it's one of those terms that, in this modern day and age, it's harder to define than what a woman is. Mm. So it depends what standard we have. Uh, some would say... Say wanting a strong father, um, that's toxic masculinity. So wanting men to be anything, um, to fit any criteria, is toxic masculinity because it's putting undue pressures on them. And you have toxic femininity, desire, you know, deriding women to have certain beauty standards and the rest, which doesn't really come into it. Um, and I would say, well, naturally you could have toxic anything. You could have, you, you could have toxic happiness. Um, but in a true sense, it doesn't exist in the form I think it's criticised as being, um, of a man being of a certain character, of a certain nature, and at least instilling that notion in society and working hard. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's, what we, at least what we've discussed so far would be toxic masculinity at all. Would you say it exists? I find it very difficult to view toxic masculinity as mm. a personality trait. The reason for why I say toxic masculinity not being a personality trait is because as you say, certain characteristics are so vitally important for someone to be considered a man in the world today. We think of the, per the people, even two or three generations ago, my grandfather, he experienced World War II, not, not at its fullest, but, mm. but to some extent, and, and his parents also experienced World War II, of course, and both world wars. These people were able to go and storm the beaches of Normandy. They were able to fight for their country, fight for freedom. And the danger, I think, about saying oh, toxic masculinity is an attack against certain forms of characters, being strong, being a masculine, being, being able to not cry or break down in face of pressure, great pressure perhaps, even at the, at the sound of machine guns getting fired straight at you and you have to charge a beach at Normandy. You might say, well, okay, that's a toxic character, but I would say it is not. Because the point of existing as a man is to have certain challenges set for you, that you will have to be able to overcome them, regardless of whether you like it or not. If you said to the people in Normandy, did you like being there? No. Would they probably prefer not to be there? Yes. But were they able to go there, do their job, and carry it out? Yes. And I think that is why I don't like viewing toxic masculinity as a character trait, mm. because every man should be prepared to go and storm the beaches of Normandy. Yes, yes. Even if they don't want to do it, they have to do it as their duty. And if we are going to target 
certain character traits as toxically masculine, we're deriving or we're getting rid of of that certain ability that humans and men have to be able to accomplish. Now, what I do think is toxic masculinity is masculinity over what men should have in a perspective mm. of what someone owns or possesses. Mm. Because, and, and a good example that we'll touch on in the future, perhaps is Andrew Tate. It's when certain people say, well, men should be able to sleep with a certain amount of women or men should be able to, men should be able to buy certain supercars. I mean, that I think is where toxic masculinity goes out of hand. Yeah. The character traits itself, I would say is not bad. Mm. Yes, yes, I, I, I think it, it does appear quite so, especially this mis misnomer of toxic masculinity onto what are merely necessary masculine traits. And uh, I just to touch on Andrew Tate swiftly. Um, this idea that a man must have certain cars or this and that is going away from values. It's going on to materialism rather than uh, perhaps uh, transcendental uh, values uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And you raise a very interesting point with men on beaches, and many in Houston conservative circles these days deride this concept of toxic masculinity because it is very much viewed, at least by people who think straight, and perhaps those uh, on the other side view it, as, view it in um, as a good thing, or what it's viewed as. It is deriding traditional masculine values. It's deriding what it really, boys or men, to be anything but what they are. And it's saying, but they now have to show emotion. They have to be in touch with their feminine side. They have to be, uh, you know, sort of, um, emotionally, uh, emotionally adept, emotionally in touch, you know, sensitive, uh, this and that, they need to see you cry and so on. And it's, it's utterly ridiculous because you remove a whole, you basically feminize a whole society and it gets rid of any distinction. So there's no longer a masculine traits or feminine traits, they're just human traits, which are all actually just what were uh, feminine traits to a greater or lesser extent. Um, so I would, I would agree, it, it, do, it doesn't exist in the way it, it, it's, it's, it's said to exist, it is how it's used. And um, some, some, some say it basically makes men sexist to, to have this toxic masculinity of having proper values. But I think recognising difference is not being sexist. To recognise that an apple is not a banana is not to be fruitist. It's to recognise an innate difference. Um, and I think that's right and proper, certainly. Hmm. Now, perhaps we can move on to the question of the role of man today. And you've touched upon it a bit, mm. where men are expected to be certain things to be more emotional, to be more, mm. to be more feminine, if, if one wants to say. I don't think it's necessarily feminine, because feminine isn't always about mm. crying. But I do think there's an aspect where there is a genuine concern about, is the role of man being degraded? Is there, and is that because there genuinely is no need for a man to exist in the modern world anymore? Because that is a very big concern, especially given the fact that, at least in developed countries, there's not much role for white-collared workers. There's not well, I mean, blue-collared workers. There's not much need for mm. a man to be cleaning the sewers. Of course, there might be, and of course, immigration then challenges that even more because then the immigrants go and do those jobs. But in a society, let's assume this ideal world where there are no longer blue-collar workers or no need for them, is being a man still under threat or is it under threat by such a phenomenon? Hmm. Is it under threat by such a... I think... I think it is under threat. Um, for men, I think these days, at least in schooling, um, we see this great push for women. They say, girls, you can be anything you want. You can be this or you can be that. You, you know, push to do anything you want. You can achieve anything. And men are told, you're sexist. You're misogynist. Um, you know, you've inbuilt sexism. You've inbuilt racism. You know, the white man, really, you are just the scum on my shoe. Uh, not perhaps in those words, but it's certainly what's implied. Um, if you go to any speech about which, you know, empowering women, doing this and that, not that we shouldn't empower women, but by its natural implication where there's nothing put at all, and it's absolutely, absolutely disgraceful to, to the men, to the boys in school, saying, yes, here's how to be a good man, here's how to be a good father, you know, this is the traits we should embody, here's you should go out and provide, you should go and do X, Y and Z, you know, you are good as you are, be real men you should be proud of. No such messaging is put in place. And really, time and time again, it's sort of, oh, look at, look at the boys doing this. Oh, boys will be boys. This is terrible. This is that and this. And ironically, if you go into the school, that's men do stick together. But there's, there's constant attack, at least as you see and you read in awful news reports, especially more in the States. Um, and there is this attack from the underlying grassroots. So perhaps not in the later years, the latter years of men who already developed, but suddenly with this push in recent years of... Social media, this large-scale attack on Andrew Tate, not that 
we sort of condoning Andrew Tate, but there's been a large attack on this idea of masculinity, and now it's always men, you must be in touch with your mental health, so you must do this and that. And not that it's a bad thing, but it's, I don't think it's the start which should be focused on, really. Mm. Mm. And you do touch on two main issues here. Is one, there's a pra practical solution on how actually are we meant to deal with it. Mm. In some sense, we should focus more on men's health or well-being, not necessarily in the form of mental health, but rather mm. talk more about how men can solve their problems in, in the same way that we care so much about women solving their problems. Because in some sense, this really horrible view of the patriarchy saying, oh, men are these oppressors oppressing mm. the women and women don't have freedom. So we have to fight for the freedums of the women mm. ad infinitum and completely forget about the men because they're still in charge mm. of everything. Yes. Is really a narrative which is very toxic and harmful. Rather, if you spent the exact same amount of effort you're trying to help the females, which I think is helpful, depending on who's actually doing the helping, but the idea of helping females is good in itself, but also helping men. Mm. I think if you did both of them and focus equally on both, you would find a lot of good solutions there. And also with the case of Andrew Tate there that you do indeed raise the attack on these male models. And even Andrew Tate's quite an extreme model, even attacks against Jordan Peterson or other figures like that. It really goes to suggest that there's a very insidious um, movement in society today which is trying to attack the role of a man being upright, proper, defending his values. And, and that is really something that I am very concerned about because when you have men who, whose role models are being attacked, when their identity is being attacked, when, when everything seems to be going against you, the people who you're meant to be caring for, and you do want to care for, because a lot of people who genuinely are true traditional masculine men want to look after women and love women in, in the most pure and truest sense there is. And if it then makes them seem to be pitted against you and the people that you want to love, you want to care for, then become to hate you and resent you for it, for the care that you want to give them, then naturally you're going to become disillusioned. Mm -hmm. And I think the disillusionment of young men is such a dangerous thing in society today. Yes, yes. And the disillusionment isn't helped by this other side mm. you mentioned, because it's, it's, it's making it quite hard to be a man. If you look at the schemes, perhaps, if you look at job schemes, we see it in Oxford when the EDI emails come through, and suddenly there's events for sort of, at least the philosophy department had earlier this year, of, oh yes, there's, there's these open talks for women, for people of LGBTQI, uh, for people of an ethnic minority. Uh, to come on and we can tell them how to apply for philosophy postgrad, um, and I, I I think it's it's rather shocking uh, in, in all these cases. Sometimes they're you know economically disadvantaged and so on. But that middle gap of men who perhaps aren't from economically disadvantaged but in that segment, they're just assumed to be privileged now. So there's there's absolutely nothing. You know, they're actually discriminated against, and you you see there, you sit there, you think, well, all of this is basically saying, well, they don't want me, and I think that it, it leads into this disillusionment where to get a job they actively try to recruit women or people from BAME backgrounds or, you know, people of uh, odd sexualities. And the, the man that exists has always existed finds it rather hard, especially we live in a country where most people are straight, white men, at least in the, in the male population, they're straight, white, and they're male. Um, and to discriminate against that large portion and not welcome them in is quite shocking. It's not saying, we don't care who you are, we want you to apply, everyone's welcome. That's an inclusive state. That's something which I would have thought the Wokes would support, but obviously not because they're not for uh, inclusivity. But if you had a talk, you say it's welcome to all. But no, there must be a safe space for these people where we exclude, and there's no safe space for the white male. And if you remember this society, it's very easy for those people to become disillusioned and force people, perhaps like Andrew Tate, where they're told, yes, you must sleep with many women. You must have these cars. You must be this and that. And haul into, I suppose, incel communities as we discussed and we discussed promiscuity, uh, rather than going to your traditional male sort of ideal and thinking, well, I'll be a strong man, I'll put forth, I'll, you know, I'll work hard, I'll be, uh, have it great integrity and so on, and be a proper man, which ironically would get one out of this disillusionment. It, they're pushed into the entirely opposite direction. Uh, and perhaps that's the toxic, ma toxic masculinity, is coming from the side wishing to purport that which is traditional as toxic. Hmm. I'm not sure how you think about that. I definitely think that that's an element of the phenomena that we hmm. see. For example, what is claimed to be toxic are often, or at least the way we've been defining toxic masculinity as the idea of having certain possessions or having certain sexual access or whatever hmm. it is. Such that these things are not in themselves evil in the sense that they stem and are expressions of fundamentally hmm. masculine desires. The, the idea of having physical possessions is very much a reflection of 
the idea of having, I guess, a certain amount of provision because someone who could buy a Bugatti or supercar in theory has more money than someone who cannot afford such things. Likewise, a person who has numerous sexual, uh, loads of sexual access seems to be someone who has a way stronger um, control over the females and also can love more women, I guess, in the pure sense. But of course, that often is then expressed in promiscuity and hookup culture, which is a very dangerous idea. So in some sense, that idea of toxic masculinity is a result of good desires, but expressed in a very poor way. And in some sense, if one re reframes our values to guide those good desires of provision, of strength, of wisdom, of discipline, then perhaps you'll see a masculinity which is strong, well defended, but also not subject to the pitfalls that we see as presented by people like Andrew Tate and others. Mm. Yes, I, 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 I certainly think so. If we just push into almost pushed anything outside, of, to push to the left, for example, in politics, creates, creates an extreme right, or what's viewed as an extreme right. Um, because it's to counterbalance. I think it's, if you look at this, this idea, everything must be at an equilibrium. Once you lurch or try to lurch one way, there's a heavy push on the opposite side to lurch back to sort of balance it out and make it central. No matter if you have, like, let's say, you split into you have ten people and seven go left, two staying, you know, the, the, the right part of the balance, and then one person to balance out those six, six seven people have gone left has to go right over here to wear it down to counter lever and you know use moments of my little bit of uh, mechanics from A level math still remains use moments to shift it back up to sort of remain balanced and perhaps that's a a view of society that could happen, and others view, oh, it goes leftwards, but rather people moving this way on the equilibrium makes it go up into more virtuous and this marvellous part of society that is simply um, that of destruction of anything evolved. And I think there was a sudden sense of honour that was at least taught down from proper men to their children of, we do certain things because this is what we do. There's chivalry, there's, you open doors for women. And you have these women now who are incredibly stubborn when you open a door for them. They refuse to go through this. I'm being polite. And even in the cases where I think, and, and now women are, 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 have gotten to the point where they're complaining, men aren't giving up their bus seats. Men aren't opening these doors. Men aren't doing this and that and the other. And I think it does stem from one part. Men are being told to do such as just being, you know, a, a chauvinistic pig to think that women need your support, to think that, you know, you should stand when a woman enters the room, to, you know, you should pay, God forbid, you know, you go out to dinner with a woman, you should pay the bill. These feminists love to split the bill, they view it as, you know, insulting that the man then expects something after them, uh, of, of them afterwards, usually in a, in a sexual manner, um, which is quite entertaining. And now, because some are now wanting it, and you have the factory who say there's all sexist and this and that, and they want to be the man, they want to pay the bill, they think they should open the door, and, you know, be empowered, and they're trying to shift uh, you know, the scales. But the hard part is we can't deny the simple biology, as you talked about at the start, where men do have a higher level of testosterone, women have more estrogen, and that does affect emotions, and it does affect other things. And it's not to be sexist, it's not to disclaim women, it's simply to state biological fact. Uh, and if, you know, it is to be chauvinistic, uh, male, sexist, to open the door, to stand up, to pay the bill, uh, to give up one seat, uh, to be polite, to walk on, you know, the, the, the left-hand side of a pavement, or uh, rather the right-hand, whichever side is closest to the road on the pavement. Uh, if that is what it means to be a sexist, chauvinistic pig uh, who has toxic masculinity, then so be it. I, I'd happily call myself that. So you've talked a bit about that idea of a chauvinistic, toxic masculine pig. Hmm. Well, you're sounding a lot like describing what some people on the internet like to call an alpha male. Now, in recent um, years, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with this, mm. but people have had the categories of an alpha, a beta, and then now the rare sigma male there is. I've gotten a few comments, or I've heard some rumours that I'm apparently considered the sigma male of college, but... Yes, you are indeed, certainly, well, yes. Perhaps so, I eat protein... In a complimentary way, yes. Yes, in a very... Well, hopefully. Yes. Well, the story that of me being a sigma male is actually quite funny. Apparently, I went to a club, entered the club, asked for an exquisite um, cocktail. They didn't have it. So I tried to convince them how to make it, and they couldn't make it, so I just left the club a moment after. Mm. So, you know, if that's fair enough. enough. Fair yeah, enough. Sure. Yes, they didn't have my yeah. favourite cocktail. But on a more serious note, an alpha male is presented often as this masculine man. You could, you could remember, you mm. can imagine a guy with loads of muscles, very strong, very dominant, trying to be the leader all the time, speaking very loudly, trying to be the centre of attention. 
The beta male is often the more effeminate one, the one who sits in the back, who, mm. who doesn't. Much like you and I. Yes, yeah, much like yeah. us. Mm. But also, instead of, but then that's where the category of kind of sitting at the back could also be a sigma male as well. But mm. kind of the sigma male has purposes drive, but the beta male just lets other men lead them and just kind of just does whatever everyone else does yeah, and kind of follow true. along with the crowd. And then the sigma is kind of the strange one that is often being used to say, well, that's a guy who kind of is a lone wolf, kind of disappears into the side, doesn't need really many friends, kind of lonely at times, but does his work very well, works hard, and tries to be what he believes himself to be. Mm. Two questions for you. Are these categories helpful? Number two, how should us, as analysts of masculinity, mm. look at them? Well, if only we could have a job as analysts, because masculinity would be great fun. But... I, I, I think, personally, it's really just a set of ideals. Of There's types, so it's to say, well, I think Alpha and Sigma, that's good and beat us, but we, you know, we should really be purposeful and strong, even in our lives. We just stand up for what we think is right. And let's, it's not to say that we shouldn't you know, have a leader of a you know, our, our masculine man and you know, follow them to some extent, and, uh, but, but that couldn't necessarily be wet. It's sort of in the sense that perhaps, let's say, one's working in a government and there's a good, strong leader one wishes to support and serve the leader, but also stands up for what one thinks is right in the outside world when the leader isn't there. Um, and, and to some extent, we should strive to you know, be forthright, have purpose, have integrity, and not just merely be a passive object. I think to be a passive object in society is really to be, I suppose, the modern term of an NPC. Uh, and for those who are not perhaps uh, technical, technically inclined, it's a, it's a non... Uh, what is it? Non player character. No, non-player character, non-player control, remember yeah. that. Um, where we just wander around, you know, we, we, we don't really get to know them. Um, and in that sense, it's not really living life to great less, great less extent. Standing up for what one believes, as I says, uh, Christian teaching would teach. We have to, to truly live a life. So we have to have purpose in it. So I think it's something good to aim for. I mean, I'm not really the helpful the, uh, the categorizations in themselves. I think we already discussed these characterizations of what it is to be a man, what it is to have masculinity. That has a greater utility than these classifications. For they, the good parts of the classifications only fall into what we've discussed and the bad part into also what we've discussed perhaps isn't so helpful. Mm. On that note, I think we can end off our discussion on mm. the topic of masculinity. Mm. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, what you think, agree or disagree with anything. I propose a toast with our ginger tea to all the fathers out there. Indeed, Indeed. cheers. Cheers.